Good afternoon, everyone. Here we are. It's September 14th, middle of September. And uh, up in the Northeast, we start approaching the gorgeous time where the humidity is low, the temperature is beautiful. Get out, take walks. I hope that wherever you are, that it's lovely as well. Um, get your paper and your pens ready. Dr. S has some interesting stuff to talk about today. I know I have a fresh page to take some notes. So uh, although there'll be opportunities to interact and have questions, I'm going to turn it right over to Dr. S so he can let us know what he's talking about today. All yours, boss. <laughs> I don't think I'm the boss, but uh, um, I thought we would talk today a little bit about the default mode network because it's such a hot topic and there's a tremendous amount of misconceptions about it. It gets really oversimplified. Uh, people latch on to stuff that comes out in the media and make statements that are overreaching. And even within field, um, people uh, in workshops say things which are overreaching or um, not always completely accurate, or sometimes things are more complex than they seem like. And um, I think it's dangerous to oversimplify some things, but there are things we can basically say. But other things that we have to realize are a little more complicated. But even more important than that, what we're doing in neurofeedback um, is becoming very important internationally. And that latest article that I talked about mm, a few weeks back by Nicholson uh, at AL 2022 is really a game changer. It, it, and I think we posted it. It's changed, really will change how the rest of the world looks at neurofeedback and trauma because they're working with MRI, functional MRI, and EEG. And this is something that Lanius and Ross and Nicholson have been working on uh, going back almost 20 years at this point. So these people have really had an incredible program and they've been relentless and done incredible work. And they are deeply in touch with the functional MRI community, unlike most of the people in neurofeedback who occasionally dip in, dip out, if even that, and then often extrapolate things which are for simplifications that can misdirect you or confuse you and start you off on things that aren't exactly right. So I thought it'd be useful to discuss the default mode network, to discuss a little bit what it means in Lanius and Nicholson research just for starters. And, um, uh, Judy had a lot of takeaways from workshops and things she's done, which are good ones, but I think we have to be careful about um, relying in them uh, in too simplistic fashion. And I have talked with a lot of other people who have had, the, I've heard the same things echoed that Judy just said. And there's, again, they're good statements, but they have to be qualified. And I think that's important. So I thought we'd just start discussing it. Anybody has any two cents to throw in? Feel free or any questions or clarifications as we go on. I'm not intending this to be like a formal lecture, but just start talking about it and getting people engaged in the concept. And the default mode network really uh, hit the ground running with uh, Randy Buckner's publication from Harvard. And I think that was 2006, 2007, somewhere around then. Maybe in the latest 2008. But that really laid things out in a really comprehensive way. Uh, and it was excellent research. It was based upon some basic research that Rachel, who's who's the guy who discovered it basically, and then Buckner uh, really evolved that with his team at Harvard, and and that was the piece. And I still rely on that. And so does everybody else. When you look in to all of these articles, they always refer back to that piece. That was kind of the foundational piece. But things have evolved since Buckner did that, although. The primary things he said are still profound and important and important for us in neural feedback. The implications weren't fully understood. Not only that, we've learned a lot more about the default network and it's more extensive than we realized. 
So a lot of times it gets presented too simplistically in terms of locations and participating hubs. And if you recall, hubs in network theory are what we call rich club hubs. That's, that's where the rest of the brain goes um, at the cocktail hour on weekends to find out what's going on with the rest of the business in the brain. And that's where all the important people show up. So that's where all the important information goes to, to the hubs. And they call them rich club networks, obviously, for that reason. And then you have all of the nodes, which is probably the houses where all the rich club people live. <laughs> and then beneath that, you have all the people who work for them, which are all the people in the corporations. Uh, and this is, these analogies are quite accurate, actually. And um, a lot of them began with Nunez uh, back in the mid 90s, 1996, when he published his first text on neocortical dynamics, particularly in our field. We had whole meetings around Nunez early on. So this little historical background. Um, here's a, a, a picture where it's been kind of um, digested and put up so you can see what the default mode network looks like. And you can see that it has a front component called the medial prefrontal cortex, and it has a posterior part called the posterior cingulate. The medial prefrontal cortex is up here, posterior cingulate's back here. Back here would be PZ, uh, anterior cingulate is mid cingulate. So the cingulum runs from the medial prefrontal to the posterior. Anybody with me on that? See my cursor? And this is kind of the main connection, the main highway between the front and the back of the brain in terms of the default mode system. But that's in terms of the default mode system only. There's another front to back network called the central executive network, and I'll get to that in a minute. And these two guys play off against each other. And this is more about, this is how I feel. And the central executive ne network is, well, this is more of what I think and I'm going to do, you know, and uh, as a consequence. So uh, what I'm going to do is an agreement between the two of them. I often call the central executive network the external attention system. It's an older term for it, and it's a subcomponent of it, but it helps us kind of get a better idea what that means. So this medial prefrontal area has deep connections to the limbic structures and to your attentional system and to your brain stem. This is the most concentrated network system in the whole brain. The other one is in the temporal lobes and the other one is back here in the default mode area back here. So those are the areas that we're always most interested in. And of course, up here, Part of this is F3, F4, the dorsal lateral region. As we get more here, this is FP1, FP2 in the in area 10, and that's the orbital frontal um, region that's just above the eyebrows there and in behind the eye sockets. Notice we, we often talk of the anterior cingulate as um, being around FZ, and, and a lot of the output networks are there. But um, it extends from FZ back to PZ, really, is, um, uh, is the mid-cingulum, and here's the anterior cingulate. Often, if you were looking at a Loretta, you would see this area lit up in the cingulate. And um, it, it made it look like the Loretta was broken, because all our clients had that area lit up. Well, what it is, is the anterior cingulate is lit up, and that happens in people who are uh, highly chronically aroused. So they have a very high biased um, central nervous system. Their sympathetic system is jacked up, basically. Their cortisol output is very high because they're constantly, initially, because they're trying to constantly overcome too much adrenaline and glucocorticoids. But over time, if they have PTSD, that cortisol drops to a really low level. They just exhaust it, and it's down in the basement. 
So PTSD people are different than just anxious people in that their cortisol is just in the basement, whereas anxious people, you know, it comes and it goes as it manages the, oh my God, it's the end of the world, and the cortisol kicks in and goes like, calm down, calm down, we'll be okay, you know. But um, with PTSD, it's like, uh, I, don't have, I don't even have the strength to calm down. So that means your sympathetic is kind of jacked up. I'm being a little simplistic here, but that's uh, kind of how it is. And uh, so you'll see a lot of times people with um, uh, migraines and high blood pressure have this anterior hot area, hot cingulate here. You'll see it in OCD too. Uh, OCD is more in this region here. It's in it activates these regions, but its primary dysfunction is in the um, motor system, which is more up front here. So that's it. When your eyes are open, this frontal area is very active. And when your eyes are closed, this area is more active. And the frontal area is, oh, let me go look out, see what's going on out there. And this is more, oh, let me, you know, Think inside and see this. So when people are gazing at you directly or, or scanning the environment and they're hypervigilant, they're more in this region. When you see them look to the left or right or up in their head as an NLP, they're coming more from this region. So the, if they have their eyes open and they do the NLP thing of up to the left, up to the right, they're really back here. If they're doing... Um, uh, if they're moving their eyes back and forth with their eyes open, they're breaking the links to back here, and that's EMDR. And that's a whole other mechanism we don't have time to talk about. But any questions on that or comments so far on that front back system? Okay, that's more of the up thing. Yeah, and if you want to add anything, because there's stuff to add sometimes that might be of value that I might not think about. I'm just making sure everybody's unhooked. Okay, now that's kind of along the midline in the main area. If we go towards more in the outer <laughs> cortex, um, what you'll see is um, this lateral inferior parietal area. Okay, that's more around P3, P4, but lower. It's probably lower down. You'll see here, this is the temporal lobe. That is, they'll say it's a lateral temporal lobe in the research. Well, that's very misleading. I mean, not lateral, they'll say it's the uh, left temporal lobe, but they don't tell you. Uh, and, and just the lateral temporal lobe is, is a little misleading too, because the actual area is right here, which is mid-temporal, lateral mid-temporal. So, it's specifically that region. Um, and that's important because um, that links up to this inferior parietal and the precuneus and the default mode system back here. So that's why when you're training at um, P4, um, T4, what you're doing is you're connecting the amygdala with the um, uh, inferior parietal. And this parietal region has direct connections with the brainstem. So you're connecting the arousal me mechanism in the brainstem indirectly with the indirect connection with the amygdala here. But you're also connecting um, the default mode network uh, activity that goes on in the temporal lobe generally. There's a lot in general, because the hippocampus within here is one of the key nodes also that's going back here. Hippocampus is memory. So a lot of that memory stuff goes back here. There's, it's in theta frequency. So there's a major input from the hippocampus back here into the theta frequencies in the back. And theta is highest in the database in the back with the eyes closed. Okay? And that's because there's really strong inputs here. It's one of the major inputs. Uh, is the hippocampal inputs back there. There's another hippocampal input that goes into the front. And that's more tied to this frontal stuff. 
because that one says, um, oh, let me, oh, go look, let me see what that is. That, oh, go look is the delta telling the frontal attentional networks, move your eyes. Again, there's connections with the MDR there. And look, and then it gets inputs as you're looking, you're getting inputs from the um, hippocampal and the septal regions, the theta, that septal hippocampal, and is going up here in the front and saying, what's important? And then it finds what's important, all right? And it starts drawing information away from the back, starts drawing attentional networks in the cingulum to the front and says, oh gosh, we gotta check that out. And it starts this feedback loop here, going like, what is it? What is it? And the central executive starts going like, yeah, what is that to the posterior area? So we get these areas start going into, what the heck are we looking at? All right? You say, hmm, what was that? And then you see an event, and then you close your eyes, and, or you look up the left. Let me think about that. Suddenly, the network start focusing on here. So you can have this front to back going on with eyes uh, open a lot. And with eyes closed, you tend to be more in the back when you're, when you're thinking to yourself or you're ruminating or going like, hmm, I got to go to do this, then I got to do this, then go to the grocery store. That's going on. But for people who have busy mind, what's happening is that um, they're doing a loop. They've taught this back, this juggling trick. Oh, do this, do this, do this, do this. I got to do this, I got to do this. That's being driven by limbic structures saying, oh God, the world's going to fall apart if I don't keep this up. When you start doing this routine stuff, the brain, I mean, anything that you do as a routine, the brain says, okay, we'll put our resources here and then we're going to go do something else and we'll leave Joe in charge. Well, Joe lives in the cerebellum and he says, okay, I'll just keep these networks going. And when that happens, you go from beta activation to alpha activation. Then you've just got this high amplitude alpha because most of that back part and that network is just idling away. You're like la, 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 la. That idling blocks data input back here. Just we don't want to know anything more about emotions and feelings. Now that can go on in the front too, because in the front you have worry. Now this is Engels et al. telling us about front to back worry versus perseverance. Um, Engels says, you know, if you're worrying in the front, well, that blocks your feelings too, because that a lot of the emotional information, most of it goes to the front. So if we do a lot of beta, we can block it. And Ledoux was the one who discovered that. And he did the, he's the major research guy on the amygdala. So you see these different teams of researchers are being woven together. Nicholson does a pretty good job of weaving them together in this beautiful article he did for neurofeedback, which is a game changer. So, so given that's the case, um, we have one other partner we've left out, which is the insula. Now you've heard me talk about the insula a lot. This is the feeling of what happens, is the insula. It's like, what do I feel about this? And it has two components, anterior and posterior. And the anterior insula in particular is critical for another network called um, the salience network. The salience network is what draws our attention front to back. It is what determines the pull of gravity of the entire brain. And that is based upon how you feel. And that's why Freeman in 2009 said, we have now come to the conclusion that the human brain is basically an emotionally based operating system. It's not rationally based. Um, and when you're afraid, it's profoundly emotionally based. It, it's, it's more arousal based actually. So the insula, tells everybody we're going to go here in the front or we're going to go here in the back. What happens in trauma is that we have um, so overwhelmed the system that it gets stuck in the back. Its primary resources are in the back. Now, yes, there's a hypervigilance system that's you know, the guard. The guard at the front gate is in full force. So we have hypervigilance. So we have the 
attentional networks constantly scanning. But the brain has gotten pulled more and more in the back. That cortisol level is low, and people are starting to self over self-reference everything. And you've heard that term personalization, and that is particularly high and key to automatic thinking, automatic feeling. It's particularly high in people who are traumatized. It's extraordinarily high in people with personality disorders, and it's extraordinarily high in PTSD. And that's why the connection between PTSD and personality disorders is so recognized, is that personalization process. That's a self-defensive process. What happens is all sensory, all networks, all processing is built around self-defense once we are severely traumatized by an event and we don't recover. Now, if somebody has a very bad day and they have a traumatic event and you inject them with um, high levels of heroin or opioids, you can actually short chain, put an end to that before it gets bad. But if you leave it behind um, uh, and you let them go on without doing that, you're going to move into the state of hypervigilance, low cortisol, a body that can't recover from constant alarm state that's going into an exhausted state. And that exhausted state is what you see in depression. And um, it shows up in a lot of people with really slowed high amplitude alpha that looks like, um, I'm going to have to block this, that, that has, um, uh, from an exhausted person, their system's exhausted. So uh, given that's what's going on, we're getting this constant front and back. The more traumatized you are, the more you dissociate to the back and you can watch people's eyes and that's where neuro linguistic programming came from you can see them constantly self-referencing the gravity the insula is saying we got to keep checking back this is dangerous this is dangerous um and that's what goes on now what happens is norepinephrine in the brain gets stuck at a high level of output um the hypothalamus hypothalamus the pituitary axis gets stuck at high output. It's constantly putting out too much norepinephrine. We have the pulvinar nucleus, which I've talked about in the past, and the hypothalamus, which is just telling the body, be prepared to run for your life at any minute. And the body's becoming exhausted. Um, and people are worrying constantly they're going to lose their high frequency activity because they're exhausting the body. We know in PTSD, ATP is progressively lost um, and um, so we see the whole system slowing down from oxidative stress so this is a system that's in a chronic state of alarm that's biased sympathetically constantly too high is hypervigilant and constantly scanning the external network with one hand but not processing cognitively so what um, Nicholson tells us in the research is that, and he's doing this because he's looking at all this research going back decades in his field, is that we notice that people who are trauma, heavily traumatized, this frontal area is underactivated. They're not reality testing. They're not using their executive function effectively. And it messes up their ability to attend because they're constantly getting pulled back into the posterior cingulate region and they're constantly dissociating and it's hard for them to know how they feel because their emotions are being subdued in place of a need to be constantly afraid and prepared. They live in a constant chronic state of fear an alarm. So this medial prefrontal area is not doing so good. So the medial prefrontal cortex is the core player, but that has some players in it, the ventral medial, 
and uh, lateral medial prefrontal cortex, and they play different roles. So that's where we start getting more complicated. Part of that group is related to the anterior cingulate and paying attention, and part of that group is deciding what to pay attention to. The lateral areas um, uh, uh, tend to be processing what more like what, what what's happening here? How do I think about this? Whereas the ventral part is saying, the anterior cingulate is saying, this is what we need to really focus on, and this is the feeling that's telling us that we need to focus on. These people, it's mostly danger. Um, so th these are the, the main structures uh, that we want to worry about. Um, and remember, again, that it's not just the cortical structures, it's the subcortical structures, the amygdala and the hippocampus, which are critical. And the nu nucleus accumbens is important too. So the septal hippocampal drives this anterior and posterior theta network. And when you're doing alpha theta, you're doing alpha theta um, back here or even at CZ. But when you have an aha experience, that occurs more around CZ if you're looking at the MRI research and the person's going like, and it's a burst of theta between this uh, this anterior cingulate and the more mid cingulate region. It's like, aha. And that's what happens in alpha theta training. And notice I'm talking about theta dominating back here. Where do we do alpha theta? We tend to do it back here in the um, cortex back here. So there's this relationship between alpha and theta in the def posterior default mode network that's very important. And I talk about that more in my alpha theta course. But in the frontal area here, um, there's a disconnect. And that's the other thing that's common about PTSD. The front and the back get disconnected. So now we have another problem is that these areas are not talking to each other too much. So what's happened is, in a sense, trauma has divided and conquered the brain. The salience network, the center of gravity is in the back. It's just only superficially looking for danger in the front and constantly jumping to the back, self-referencing it. And again, this is personalizing everything that goes on. And... Uh, it's all about me, and I'm in danger, and I need to protect myself. And then you have the cognitive behavioral dimensions of automatic thinking, you know, maximization, minimization, a tunnel vision. That's where the tunnel vision comes from this process. Black and white thinking comes from this process. It's all an outgrowth of that. Um, and when we're looking at the um, this division, we have to remember that these areas are fragmented and the common input is the emotional brain driving both of them through the insula. Now in my past presentations, I've shown that the insula is deeply connected to the system, the vagal system, which goes directly to the gut. And this is where the polyvagal system plugs into this whole thing. This is fight, flight, or freeze. And um, and this is why we're interested in symmetry, because there's the more the left is act. Yeah, question, comment. No, yeah, just this is Rodney. Just um, I was just thinking, John, for referencing, I seem to think. Remember OCD being more dorsal, anterior cingulate. Is it possible that they found something that's dangerous to latch onto, and they lock onto it and don't want to move their attention from it? Does that make any sense? It, that is what's going on in the network, yeah. And some people are more stuck on latching on and more people are stuck on letting go. According to Peterson and Posner, who did the original research in the 90s and then uh, Peterson re revisited it, um, you know, what have we learned since then in a fantastic and beautiful article. I think it was 2006, 2008. Maybe even sooner. I have to go back and look. But it still holds true. The anterior cingulate grabs onto new things, and that's the medial prefrontal. Oh, I got to get this. Oh, I got to get that. And the posterior cingulate, because like, I'm done with that. I've self-referenced that. 
I know what that's about. I'm not going there. And that's more the posterior. Those components get really divided up in trauma. But um, OCD is an outgrowth of that process, but the last research I saw it on was that it was a dysregulation in the, um, people respond to trauma differently. For some people, the dysfunction occurs in the cautate nucleus and the putamen in these groups of cells called matrisomes and striosomes, and that's at the output region of the basal ganglia, the motor system. So while some people may have a tick in their motor system, other people um, thinking and talking is an extension of the motor system of doing. And that's why it's in the premotor area and it involves putamen and the caudate. So that's another way of expressing trauma. So what we really have to do, and this is what I've been trying to tell people, is we have to look at this what we're calling trauma, uh, its manifestation, it shows up in those four different ways I showed you last time in the trend screen, but it shows up in um, glitches, in a sense, in the motor system, and those can be a tick, they can be related to thought. Um, in a milder version, they can be related to adapters, pulling your hair, biting your teeth, an extreme form, it's OCD. Um, and in all those forms, the more you move into the motor system, the more you move away from the emotional system. So the more people do the motor system, the more they blockade the amygdala and the emotional system. So they are extreme adapters. Tick is an extreme adapter. Um, OCD is a stream adapter. It allows us not to feel the fear the amygdala is putting out, which in trauma is almost like seizures in the amygdala. Um, and the amygdala becomes way more sensitive, and that's why it's so important. You know, this is from Menon, 2011, 2012, who's the major, one of the major um, meta reviewers of MRI, functional MRI and imaging studies. And this is showing you the chart. Now, this is going back to 2011. This is almost 10 years ago. They're talking about this then. Now we're just talking about it in terms of neurofeedback. And AI here in this diagram, see here's the sensory inputs, and here's your visceral inputs from the uh, vagal pathways in particular, um, uh, but also from uh, uh, the heart system, goes into the anterior insula that drives the anterior cingulate, dorsal anterior cingulate, it's hooked up with the dorsal ventral medial, and, and uh, prefrontal cortex. So these um, drive what's going on here in, in such a way, and let me get the next one. This is from an old lecture, which you can find up on YouTube. So that this is the state. So here is Menon talking about Meehan and Bresler, which is probably the best article in network theory, and even today still is, and it's 10 years old. Um, here is your uh, anterior insula and your anterior cingulate. This is a frontal network. That's a salience network, and it's switching back and forth from what they're called endogenously mediated um, self-referential activity, which is the default mode network. And here you can see the front of the default mode network ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and then the posterior cingulate cortex in the back. So it's switching back to front. So this is doing that. And then here's the central executive, and that's exogenally. That's more frontally oriented, uh, and exogenally because external, external attention system. And it's dealing with cognitive demand and mental activity. You know, what am I seeing and what should I do about it? And this is, you know, the feet get moving section and we got to get out of here and think about this. And it is the central concept now. And as far back as 2011, 2012, there were articles published from England about um, this default mode system now being able to explain major components of um, Freud's theories. And there's a brilliant article on that 
which, which takes you a year to read, but it's brilliant and talks about all these structures and how they relate to to psychodynamic theory and psychology, one of the major seven schools. But, but here and everywhere, have, you know, and I've been talking about this at meetings and since the day I saw it 10 years ago, because it was mind boggling that this salience network uh, driven by the anterior insula, which is, and this explains to you why when you train at T3, which is right near the, in, the insula, people have these intense reactions because you're activating the salience network, opening up to the amygdala, and you're getting their, um, they're starting to feel stuff that they're trying to block. And then they go back and they go later that the neurofeedback is making me feel terrible. That's why you have to pull back from T3, T4. You have such a direct connection to the salience network and the amygdala. It's just like more than most people can handle. And you can trigger autonomic responses. And that's why the authors, when they were doing T3, T4, and still are, they're triggering all these autonomic responses because they're not noticing that they're opening the gateway to people's deepest fears uh, about what has happened to them in their lives. And that's because they're not into psychology. I used to teach psychology and I've done 25 years of work, both in institutions and clinics. And uh, that's what drives my interest and what's going on. It's not engineering. So this is why it's, that area is so sensitive and often the last place you want to train. Um, this front to back here is the fundamental concept behind the newer uh, thinking about psychopathology. And this is why I say to you, really trauma is a spectrum and people with support in, in their developmental periods are able to learn to manage trauma and it's a powerful tool because that gives them a, an ability that most people can't get. 60 to 70 percent population doesn't learn that and 50 percent are either going into or out of a mental disorder and 30 percent are having anxiety and or depression. And that's why I say anxiety and depression is a major proxy indicator for trauma and disorder. And that's why asymmetry is such a profoundly powerful measure for determining it, more powerful than most except for deficits in theta in the posterior. And why would that be? Well, the posterior is where the default mode network is and the main inputs in theta. And if somebody's blocking their theta, that theta is down, that means they're pushing, they're fighting against trauma and they could fight against it in your trend screens in one of four ways. They could ramp up their alpha, they could ramp up their theta and dissociate, you know, rampant alpha is busy nine, or they could um, uh, push down their theta, particularly frontally, and just block any input and worry constantly. And you get some elevated beta there for a while until they run out of energy. Uh, and you'll see that in their muscle tension. So you'll see high beta everywhere. So these are different ways that we block and manage the default mode networks. If, so my, my takeaway on this is that there's more than one way. You can see this complex network. See that there's you know, the gravity shifts from the front to the back. The front becomes underactive. It begins to block input because it's overwhelming. The back begins to block input and you have an isolated system, you know, default one network. This is not reality testing well. It's not connected to the rest of the system. And it's just relying on the external attention system for input. I mean, it's half a system. Given that's the case, at first in neurofeedback and MRI research, they try to calm the amygdala down in the temporal lobes. And exactly what happened to them is what happens to you when you try to do training at T3, T4. They went, holy mackerel, these, all these ab reactions. And then they went to um, the parietal lobe and started working there and say, oh, wait, we don't get ab reactions here as much. Well, because 
they are going to an area that has less direct um, input to the amygdala and has more complex input to the system and adjust the system at large more. So they're really more retracing through that system. If you go to the frontal area, you've got too much control too. And you'll, if you do FP1, FP2, and somebody was emailing that about the other day, um, you'll over arouse people right away. Because they're, again, you're really ramping up that anterior cingulate and ventral medial prefrontal cortical system. You don't want to do that right away. You want to stabilize them in their sleep in the central region and then um, try to reduce the depressive and let them integrate, start integrating, and they're going to be more anxious. And then you're going to have to go to the back and train um, direct inputs to the amygdala. Then you can train that and calm that system down through the O and O2 inputs. And then finally, you can go to P3, P4, well, PZ really, and do alpha, theta, and start the integration process. So the, you're working in reverse. You're retracing, as they say in homeopathy, through the system. And even in pathology, that's how the body heals. And there's good days and bad days. So when the day you start neurofeedback, your clients are going to have good days and bad days because that is a fact in how people heal, both in pathology and physiology and in psychology. And that's well recognized if you read it, read it in research. So there's more than one way to get at trauma. Yes, you can train alpha down, and Bill Scott figured that out back in the um, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. He just started doing that intuitively, and it worked long before these people got into it and even published that, but nobody knew why. Bill didn't know why. He had theories, and they were pretty close to right, actually. And... Um, I was finding the same thing out. I have these people with high alpha. I can't train it up. I need to. But I didn't, instead of training it down, I went someplace else. I trained symmetry instead and then went to alpha theta. Because for me, that was a difference. So, so you can train symmetry. You can train alpha down. Uh, training theta up does not work very well. So that's kind of doesn't go. And that's what Elmer Green found. But he found that. If he let people um, train alpha up, if they didn't have too high of an alpha, if he let them train it up, you know, that style of dealing with trauma, if you let those people with low alpha or too much beta train alpha up, then they would automatically slip into theta processing, which is what happens in alpha theta. So I would say don't get your hopes up on just one mode, training alpha down at PZ, training um, down whatever is too high, often beta, at P4, uh, T4, uh, or alpha down that way. You know, uh, I've trained SMR up and alpha down with lots of people with from the, uh, in the military with trauma instead of alpha theta, just to get them stable enough so I could do alpha theta a lot over the last two decades. There's a lot of ways to get this, and hopefully you see how complex these get, at least to, you know, to get all this at once is almost impossible. I mean, I've been reading about this stuff for 20 years and over and over and over again, and I've lectured on it over and over and over again at meetings, and that's the only way I can get it in my head. I mean, I eat, drink, and sleep this stuff, but you have to be in a clinic helping people. You don't have time for that. Absorbing this is really hard. And you have to hear it again and again and again. And that's what I'm trying to do from different angles at these different lunch and learns occasionally. And pointing out research you can read, and a lot of you I know will just go glassy-eyed reading it, because you have to know all these acronyms and like, wait, who's on first? ACC, PFC, or DLM, or VLM, PCC, or I'm, you know, I'm lost. Um, so if you find this overwhelming, you should. And if you get anything out of it, that's great. And I will repeat this stuff in different formats again and again. But I thought since I'm in the middle of it again for other projects, other lectures and PowerPoints and books and stuff and articles, while I was fresh in my mind, I thought I'd share it again, what the latest stuff coming out on all of this is. Because I'm, you know, have to 
drill deep for all the latest stuff. But it gives me great insights into what's been going on in my past experience and my present experience clinically, and I thought it might be of assistance to you guys. Anybody have any comments or further questions? And if I get bored with LSU football, maybe I can study this instead. Yeah, that's <laughs> why I don't have time for football. <laughs> this is what I do on my weekends. But for me now, it's fun. When you start out, it's like painful. It's like reading brain maps. Hopefully, this has helped. Yeah, somebody's going to say something? Is that Ryan or Sarah? One of the best things about listening to you talk about this is as things click more and more, we really get to uh, be more sophisticated when we're going to make a change about something because we can put it all together as to what's happening with the training that we're doing, the manifestation in the person that we're training, and the direction that we're going. To understand this at deeper and deeper levels really allows us to have a deeper degree of sophistication in our work. Yeah, uh, and that to me is what's important. At the best colleges and universities that I taught at, every one of the departments, whether psychology, sociology, stats, whatever, all promoted conceptual thinking as opposed to high school, which is just rote learning, which is why BCIA liked my course and why a lot of people don't. You know, well, can't you just give me the answers to the questions to memorize? No, BCIA wants you to know some concepts so you can think on your feet. And that's why I'm doing this so that you can think on your feet, mm -hmm. so that you can evaluate research, but mostly so you can help your clients and you can make sense of what the heck you're seeing with all of these factors. To know conceptually what's behind it is very powerful, I think. Yeah, Richard, that's uh, very helpful to have, uh, you know, this overview and the inter your ability to integrate the, these um, schools of thinking. And to, once I have a visual model, uh, it, it's very helpful for it to uh, stick. And the, the acronyms, I wonder, uh, you know, I was thinking of... Um, uh how rob has a, a way of simplifying certain things whether there there is there some glossary somewhere that these acronyms can be um <laughs> explained uh, and probably and somewhere. Your back pocket because, uh, you know so many uh you're talking about the different disciplines right it's such a shame that um many other disciplines and and because i'm interacting with psychiatry a lot they they have no clue about trying to integrate this and look at the um look at uh how meds could work together with with neurofeedback if only they uh if only we had a common language well we should uh, i was reading a medical uh journal article one of the best one of the best physiological descriptions of all we know to date about PTSD physiologically was written by MDs with PhDs. And they, they write more practically than researchers. They, you can really easily, much more easily understand it. They make this way easier to understand, but they even talk about that. For instance, they say SSRIs are really fantastic at um, helping people repair some of the damage done by PTSD for the short, short term. It's, not advisable for the long term. That's the wrong way. But for short term, SSRIs uh, help repair uh, a lot of important uh, mechanisms, or particularly um, in areas that we don't usually think about, like the endocrine system. It's very important for recovery in the endocrine system. So there's something, or the idea that you could give um, um, opioids to somebody to post trauma in the ER and help them not come out with um, PTSD uh, from an auto accident or a horrible event or an officer or a fireman who's experienced something horrific who's there. I mean, these things and know when and how much to use it. It's in the literature and it's here. Um, 
it's just that most people don't have the time to get to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like <clears throat> Bessel, you know, Dr. Bessel. Uh, yeah, Bessel's brilliant. He's talk, an excellent and of course, teacher. Yeah. And, and, and like Porges is brilliant too, but he, he's got such a wealth of information in the one area, he doesn't have the ability to integrate yes. this neuroscience part. But yes. I, I, I know from talking to him that he's really, um, he knows <laughs> he knows that that's probably the direction he's going to have to go in um, mm -hmm. to apply some of this integrative uh, polyvagal theory because once you have these mm -hmm. visuals, you're able to ground it just like he grounds the polyvagal yep. in biology. Now we've got to do it in the neurophysiology. Yes, well, polyvagal is great, but it's only a small part of the story. And okay. it's at a very fundamental mammalian level. You know, what we're talking here is cortical, sub cortical, emotional, subcortical. For us, this is really, really where the dilemma and the split occurs. And it, and we're very vulnerable as a species to it. Uh, but I, I would say of all the authors I've read, Van der Kolk seems to have a better interdisciplinary grasp on this than the majority of people I ever read uh, by far. He's unusual, very unusual. Right. Hopefully later on we're going to have more time to talk about the the definition of self because <laughs> since you brought up the oh, psychodynamics, gosh. the definition of the self is going to uh, help us understand um, how to keep grounded and. Um, well, that's a whole right, separate right. lecture series in itself. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know. Well, your 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 book on the automatic self is the primer, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Mm -hmm. it is. Okay, okay so, well, we're running over, and I know everybody has to get going on. Hopefully, this has helped you all, those of you who are familiar with the material, maybe an opportunity to meditate, get some new insights, you know, processing. Um, those of you new, get introductions to it that aren't completely overwhelming, hopefully, and um, uh, you can think through any of this. And I guess we'll probably just sit with so much me just talking. Uh, I'll just... We'll post this up there and people can go back and look at it. That's just, you know, go musings on Thank uh, you. full mode network. <laughs> You're welcome. So, I, I really appreciate this, Richard, a lot. And I, for me, a lot of times I have to go back a couple different times and, and listen and things. Cause oh, me too. There's a plethora of information. Sometimes the dots connect and sometimes they really don't. Same yes. for me. I, I have to read yeah. this. I, I, you know, if you go to read that Nicholson article, I mean, I had to read it like six times and take notes every time. And it's there's a lot. I mean, a research article that has all of that stuff, all of Ross's articles, they're, they're all there's, they go back 10, 20 years more in all the research and in such concentrated sentences in such detail. It's like reading mm -hmm. poetry. I mean, you can't just read an article and one sitting and know it that's impossible nobody could do that so dr Cedar, if you do this five more times we might get it that's true <laughs> that's why i'll put it on a video and you can watch it five more times so i don't know if i can do it as well as i did today <laughs> maybe excellent. i could thank you <laughs> this was wonderful i think we all really appreciated the work that you put into it well i'm i have time and you all don't have time and um, i'm a teacher so hopefully this will help so, folks, we'll see you again on Friday afternoon at noon, and enjoy your next couple of days. I hope uh, that they're wonderful. Yep. So, thank you for being here. We couldn't do it without you. <laughs>